Okay, good morning, everybody. I've got you mute muted right now, but I'm assuming you can hear me. Okay, uh, so what I'm going to do is what we did last week. I'm going to unmute everybody and ask you guys then to mute yourselves, and you can unmute yourselves and just pop into the conversation whenever you want to. So, and we'll find out who's paying attention. All right, everyone is unmuted. Okay, um, before we get started on, on the waterfront, um, are there any sort of lingering um, issues or ideas or thoughts regarding... Um, oh, people drive me crazy. Brian, <laughs> either be with us or not. There we go. Um, any last lingering ideas or thoughts about vertigo from anybody? Um, I kind of had one. Yes, go ahead. So I think it's kind of curious um, to think about movies that are older and how they're very successful in their time, but how they'd be perceived today. So I'm kind of curious if you think this film would be received as a good film or a like a one of the better films if it was made today with his character being so like controlling of the female character and all that kind of stuff. Like, how do you think it'd be perceived today? Well, I think, um, I think that's a very difficult question. So obviously if it were made today, it wouldn't look like the way it looks. It wouldn't have been produced the way it was produced. It wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be exactly the same movie. Um, and my suspicion is that a filmmaker today would actually lean in to a lot of those issues even more than Hitchcock was either willing or able to do. So if you think about something that's even 35 years old, like Blue Velvet, which um, in a weird sort of way does deal with some of the same kinds of themes as Vertigo, and you have a filmmaker like David Lynch completely sort of unencumbered by production codes or, or societal uh, restrictions or censorship of any kind, um, and really sort of addressing um, in, in, a, in a, 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 a very direct way the ideas of, of, of misogyny um, in a way that makes a lot of people really uncomfortable. And there are a lot of people um, who look at Blue Velvet and basically hate it because they think it's a movie that, that basically reveals that its filmmakers hate women. And there are other people who look at Blue Velvet and they say, well, this is a movie that's about misogyny and it's about you know the, the hatred of women in, in society. So um, in a roundabout way to answer your question, I suspect that a vertigo made today would be even more vertigo than vertigo is. Um, and that it would still be somewhat controversial. I, I, I have to personally admit the thing that intrigues me the most is the idea that I think it's, um, I think it's David Fincher um, brings up um, the idea of making a version of Vertigo that is from Judy's point of view, which I think would be really, really sort of fascinating film. Um, but yeah, you know, in terms of how it would be taken, you know, it's, it's kind of it's kind of hard to say. But but I I do think that some of the themes that are you know, the more I watch Vertigo, the more I am personally convinced that rather than being something that unconsciously reveals a lot of the filmmakers' um, fetishes and fixations and obsessions. And it is that, um, that it is just as much a movie that examines them. Um, I, you know, I think Hitchcock is very, very much aware um, that, that he's making a movie about his own obsessions and, and his own attitudes about women and the attitudes of his industry about women. And um, I don't know, it gets a little more interesting every time I, I look at it. Um, what else about Vert? Did that, did that answer your question, Brian? Was it Brian? No, it's Bryce. I mean, yeah. Bryce. Bryce. Okay. All right. what, what are your thoughts on it, Bryce? Um, I think to, I think a type of film. I guess yeah. You you said that it wouldn't be 
like shot the same way. It wouldn't be edited the same way or anything like that comparatively today. But I think the same kind of storyline that could happen today, it would just be very interesting to see how they would do it because I think with the whole, with um, the Me Too movements and all these, uh, the whole blacklist of Hollywood that recently just happened, I'd be very curious to see a story like that being played out today. And they, I feel like if someone was to do that, they'd be very careful about it. Yep. But I think it would be interesting. I know I absolutely agree and and you know it's one of those movies that it, it, again like like the searchers it it is in many ways a very flawed movie but but the more I watch it the more I, I think there's more to it every time I watch it anything else about vertigo guys uh, I got a question for you yeah so uh, this question is in regard to the character Midge Yes. Um, okay. So from what I'm gathering now, uh, at the, I guess towards the beginning of the movie where they're having a conversation, um, they talk very briefly about how, um, I guess they were, uh, engaged for a very short period of time. I do think um, they say that. Yeah. Uh, and they only talk about that one time and then throughout the movie, um, I guess, uh, there are a couple of scenes where it looks like Midge is still in love with Scotty. Yeah. And um, I, I guess it gets to a point where, um, you know, when he has the breakdown uh, because he sees or what he thinks he sees is, uh, um, uh, you know, what's her name? Uh, that, that falls to her death. And then he has that mental breakdown. Right. And then they, then they go into the, uh, uh, I guess the mental ward or wherever and the last thing you see with the with Midge's character, she's talking to the doctor, and basically the doctor says, "Yeah, it's going to take you know six months to a year or whatever until he's cured, right?" right. And then she just kind of walks down the hallway and then disappears, and you don't see her again for the rest of the movie. That's true. So I'm kind of confused. What happened to her character? I mean, was was she just thought he was going to be you know crazy for the, you know. The rest of his life and she just gave up on him or you know what's the deal with her character she just disappears well i will i mean i'll give you my take but it's just my oh, take okay um sure. and my take is that once scotty um it, it all it, obviously the whole movie takes place in san francisco but to me there's almost a feeling at the time that he meets judy that he is like almost in a, in a new space he's in a new area um and again, there's this there's this sort of chopping block moment in which this movie kind of shifts from being one movie to another movie. And it's at that scene, I think, that you just mentioned. Um, and I think, you know, everything in Scotty's life just seems to not be important except for converting Judy into Madeline. And I think more than that she gives up on him, it feels to me like he just has no room in his life for anything else. You know, we know that when Hitchcock was forced to go back and make um, and shoot a, 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 an ending that would address uh, the idea of the, the husband sort of getting away with the murder, um, he brought Scotty and Midge back together. So I don't think Hitchcock in his mind sees that as being completely, you know, a relationship that's completely gone. I just think it doesn't matter. Um, and I think, you know, the, we, we talked last week about Midge being sort of a counterpoint in a way to Judy and to Madeline. Um, and I think that counterpoint in that second half for Hitchcock is probably not, no longer important, no longer necessary. Okay. Um, so, you know, one of the things you'll see with Hitchcock is when he's not interested in something or he thinks something no longer matters, it just goes. When he thinks the story is over, he just cuts. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, there's, there's, there's no link, you know, Hitchcock is famous. Hitchcock's famous quote, of course, is drama is life with the dull bits left out. Um, maybe in the second half for Hitchcock, the midge was just some of the dull bits that got left out. Okay. But you're right. There's no, there, there is no closure we talked a lot about lack of closure in this movie there really is no closure for this relationship between scotty and midge she is both as a character and as a device kind of just shuffled off to the side when we get into that last third or last half other thoughts on that earl 
Uh, no, it was just um, I I, I kind of got this impression that they were, they were going to like build up and that I was expecting her to have something to do with the actual climax of the movie at the very end. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, because this is actually the first time I've seen this movie, and um, and I, I I don't know. It just kind of felt like they were kind of building her up, but kind of on the side. Um, and through most of the movie, you know, she, I mean, she's not really like a main character, but there are, you know, points where they come back to her and, you know, like when she's driving past um, uh, Scotty's house and she's, she sees him, you know, um, with Judy and, and, you know, I just kind of felt like, you know, they were going to make something of that. Like, you know, was she going to try to get, you know, Scotty back, you know, is, is she going to be the competition or whatever? And then it just, it, I don't know, it's just kind of like it was building up and then it was like, eh, never mind. I think he's going to be crazy for the rest of his life and I'm out. <laughs> you know, and those, those are all reasonable reactions because, because, you know, as her function as a counterpoint, to, especially to Madeline, even more than to Judy, because we would never really get much of a comparison between Midge and Judy. Midge is gone, by right? The time we meet Judy, uh, that counterpoint between Midge and um, uh, Madeline does, in 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 a traditionally structured story, suggest um, um, a. Uh, I'm sorry, the word is is escaping me. It it suggests a confrontation that never happens. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So, what I, so I think it's perfectly reasonable to kind of you know expect that, and that it again, it just seems to be something that Hitchcock didn't want to follow up with or wasn't interested uh, in pursuing. Yeah. And you know, I think it is part of this thing that is so strange about the structure of this movie that this movie really does you know more than 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 many other films I can think of or stories I can think of just completely shift gears. I mean, it changes completely from one story into another. And the only thing that carries across is, is, is Scotty, you know, until we realize that Judy and Madeline are the same person. The only thing that really carries across that divide is Scotty. Anything else about Vertigo? Okay, um, I'm still working on, as, as many of you who were here early could see, I'm still working on completing the On the Waterfront PowerPoint. So I know none of you have had a chance to see it. I, I, wanna, I wanna share the screen a minute um, and just give you a brief overview, an introduction of, of kind of where we are in history and what some of the important um, influences are. And then I'll let you guys go back later and look at, look at this in more detail. Um, and then if I can, as soon as I can get through this, we will get back to uh, just having a nice conversation. So th the things that I want to um, mention, and they're things that we've mentioned before, um, as, as we get into On the Waterfront and, and we move forward in film history, is, is to go back for a moment and talk about this idea of realism and formalism. We talked about this back when we talked about silent films. Um, and this idea that there are, by the way, that, you know, we don't do, we don't seem to do a lot of this in, you know, in, in our colleges as much as we used to, but there, there are, have been people in film history whose jobs, who took on the task of, of thinking <laughs> about movies, of theorizing about movies, of making decisions that movies should be this or should be that, and then spending their entire lives sort of supporting these ideas. You know, one of those people is a guy named Siegfried Krakauer. Another guy is a guy named Andre Bazan. We're, we're going to mention both of them very quickly. You know, Siegfried Krakauer is one of the first persons to come up with this idea that this, there's this conflict in, in, in movies in particular between realism on one side, which, you know, at the beginning of cinema could be the Lumiere brothers and formalism, you know, very stylized, um, you know, very, you know, things that aren't realistic, things that are very subjective, things that are very dreamlike, um, things that have this sort of heightened technique to them. Uh, formalism, like, like uh, Georges Méliès, sort of on the other side. Um, a, a lot of, 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 you know, and their, their characteristics, you know, is it, realism, you know, location filming, long takes instead of montage, invisible editing instead of conscious editing, 
you know, just eye level shots, normal lenses, natural lighting, you know, naturalistic acting, just, just whatever it can be to sort of downplay the medium and upplay the, the representational aspects. One of the things that Krakauer said was, you know, the whole history of art has been moving us more and more towards realism. That, you know, if we look at painting, you know, paintings were very stylized for a while, and then paintings became very, very, uh, as, as we go through art history, became very representational until they started then going abstract. That movies pick up the baton at that point, and movies, you know, photography picks up the baton at that point, and photography is able to represent realism in a way that art seemingly never could before and in a way that is more appropriate to photography than it even is to art. And then the movies pick up that baton again, and they are more capable of being realistic than any art form we've ever had. Therefore, that's what they ought to do. They ought to be realistic. Um, so, you know, we have all these things that are basically just kind of, kind of, kind of trying to emphasize the realism and de-emphasize the technique. Formalism is exactly the opposite. We don't care about realism. It's not even important what's in front of the camera. It's how it's being shot. It's how it's lit, how it's stylized, you know, exaggerated angles, exaggerated lenses, abstract settings, abrasive Soviet style editing, all this stuff. Now, the thing of it is you got realism way over here and you've got formalism way over here. And in the middle, you kind of have what most movies are, which is some kind of compromise between those two ideas. And you can, you can kind of take movies and you can kind of chart them along a sort of spectrum if, if you really, as most of us right now do, have nothing to do. You could really go with movies and kind of find a place to put them um, on a spectrum. The reason this becomes important is that post-World War II, you know, we've talked a lot already about how much about the world, how about much about America, how much about art, how much about film, changes between from pre-World War II world to post-World War II world. Um, and that there, there are lots of things that are brought to cinema after the war by filmmakers who have experienced the war, by film viewers who have experienced the war. They may have a different need or a different expectation from cinema, something a little more cynical something a little more realistic, perhaps. Not always. There's still going to be a room for Star Wars. There's still going to be room for Wizard of Oz. There's still going to be room for those kinds of movies. But, you know, this guy here, Andre Bazan, who was one of the French critics um, who were working with people like Jean-Luc Godard and Francois Truveau and who, who established the new wave, which we're going to talk about uh, next time. Um, was one of those guys that really came out there and just they said, you know, realism is what this should be. Movies should be realistic. They should have long takes. They should have deep focus. They should have very limited editing. You know, they should, they should avoid using known actors or movie stars. All that stuff should be put aside. Um, there's a great video there, by the way. So if we think about the movies we've seen before, we think about Hollywood films of the classic Hollywood studio system. We think about the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. By the time we get into the 50s and into the 60s, the power of the studio system is starting to wane. And because of that, um, the, 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 a lot of the elements that go into making movies that look like the movies that are on the screen right now begin to wane as well. But if we look at Casablanca and Citizen Kane and Singing in the Rain and um, Stagecoach um, and Vertigo, for that matter. Um, we, we see that the main goal of these movies is not realism, that they're kind of stylized, they're kind of fanciful, they're not they're, they're melodramatic, sort of heightened. There's all sorts of you know, things going on there that are not what we would consider realistic. And there are some reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons is that most of these movies are shot in the studio. Casablanca, for example, almost every shot is in a soundstage. Citizen Kane, almost every shot is in a soundstage. Um, stage, even Stagecoach, which is shot on one of the greatest locations in the history of cinema, 
that location itself is, is very mythic and very odd and very unique and very stylized. And even then, the rest of the movie is all shot in sets and sound stages and shot on uh, movie ranches that are just outside of Los Angeles. And that first shot of John Wayne in Stagecoach is a back projection of Monument Valley. So, you know, the studios liked movies to be shot on their property because proximity to them was control. When movies, there's a famous movie from 1939 called Gunga Den, directed by George Stevens, who's one of those directors who went overseas during the war and came back a changed man. And Gunga Den was famous for going out into the desert to shoot and going completely out of control and the studio desperately trying to get it back in control and get it back on schedule, get it back on budget. But just the fact that they were out there on their own made it harder to control. So studios really wanted to keep these movies on their lots. And you know, if you're on the lot and you're in a sound stage, you're creating reality from scratch. And if you're creating reality from scratch, you're probably going to create a reality that's more in your head and less a complete representation of the real world, right? We also have the production code. So we've talked about this before. This starts in 19, this starts being, being uh, uh, enforced in 1934. Um, if, if you have movies that are not allowed to lower the moral standards of those who see them. They can't have sympathy for the crime or wrongdoing or evil or sin. They have to have a happy ending of some kind. That They have to be correct in terms of their standards of life. What a phrase. Um, they, you know, they, they, they have to uphold law, both natural and human. They can't ridicule. They can't have, you can't have sympathy for the violation of law. You have all of these things that, you know, and many, many more that are being controlled by this, you know, or either restricted or limited, you know, brutal killings, firearms, drugs, liquor, adultery, passion, seduction, rape, miscegenation is something that's not allowed in these movies. The, 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 the mixing of the marriage of, you know, white and black characters or characters of different races, things that are as, as general as obscenity and profanity and nudity, um, even, you know, the, the, the way in which bedrooms are shown, the use of the American flag, all of these things are controlled. And this is, you know, we, we saw this famous photo before. This does not promote reality. This does not promote realism. This promotes a sort of rose-tinted, fanciful view of America or of the world. So we've got these elements that are pushing against the idea of realism. We've got the production code. We've got the studio system. And we've also got, by the way, a great video here I really recommend you take a look at. We also have the influence of these guys we've talked about who run these studios, these, these men who run these studios. This is one of my favorite quotes from Stanley Donnan, right, the co-director of Singing in the Rain. And he's talking about Louis B. Mayer. You see him down here with the famous, see him right down here with the famous uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer lion. Um, so this is a guy who's in charge of the studio. And this is what Stanley Donnan, who worked under Metro, you know, Louis B. Mayer making movies like Singing in the Rain said. I'm gonna go ahead and just quote this. So Stanley Donnan was being interviewed by um, uh, NPR, by uh, Terry Gross. And he said of Louis B. Mayer, he had a large input into what kinds of films were made. He wanted films to be only sweet and gentle and talk about mothers loving sons and sons and daughters and family things. He loved the Andy Hardy series, which showed the only kind of family life he really liked to see. This is Andy Hardy down here, Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland, having their malted milks. Um, he didn't like to see, for example, women in slacks. Drove him mad. He thought it was not feminine for a woman to wear pants. He had a lot of things which found their way into the whole studio out, but he didn't like shiny surfaces for some reason. 
He didn't like things reflecting. So MGM films, unless you fought very hard, had a very soft look to them. He didn't like dark shadows. So MGM black and white films had filled in light in the shadow areas. There were all kinds of odd things. Now these are the sort of personal peccadilloes of one person that basically then influences the entire output. So absent a production code, absent a concern about shooting in sound stages and on studios, you've got guys in charge who have certain attitudes about, you know, what world do they want to show to their audiences? What vision of the world do they want to promote? Right? And that leads in to this, this sort of stylized, fanciful, this wonderful, beautiful fantasy world that is Hollywood movies of this period. Um, by the way, you know, and, and again, this idea of one man. So over at 20th Century Fox in the 1950s, uh, this guy right here, Daryl F. Zanuck, um, was in charge of production. He was the president. Um, he was one of the first people that Elia Kazan and Bud Schulberg took on the waterfront to. And his response after reading the script was, who wants to see a movie about sweaty longshoremen? Well, obviously, Daryl F. Zanuck didn't. So that movie was not made at 20th Century Fox. It wouldn't fit into the vision of the world that Daryl F. Zanuck was trying to promote or that he wanted to exist. Um, so all these things are fighting against the idea of realism, right? Um, and by the way, this content, this look, this is also a conscious style. This is something that filmmakers are just reveling in and they're making, right? This is, this is, this is the world they want to present as well. It's not all being necessarily imposed upon them, right? Um, we can, you can also go into the PowerPoint sometime if you just want to see sort of what movies of this period, how they represented New York. Uh, you know, a New York that existed almost totally in the sound stages and on the back lots, these big pieces of property where they would build standing structures, um, just fronts, really, you know, just being propped up from, you know, the storefronts being propped up from behind by two by fours. Um, and they could redress these sets or these, you know, they, they could, there were residential areas, there were business areas, they could redress it. It could be Chinatown this week, it could be New York the next week, it could be San Francisco the week after that. But again, it allowed for lighting to be very carefully controlled and it allowed for reality to be created rather than represented or photographed. So you have this New York that isn't, really New York, but is kind of New York, right? We can even see behind the scenes how they're shooting things like this and in, in trying to, you know, in creating this, this, this sort of image. The point being, this is not the New York, and it's actually in on the waterfront, New Jersey, but this is not that reality. This is a different reality. Now, the other thing that pops in here that we need to talk about really quickly, and I'm, I know I'm being long-winded today, but um, is, is what's going on in Europe and the influence of Europe on what's happening here. So one of the things that happens during World War II is a lot of cameras are developed that are cheaper, they're smaller, they're portable. They've been kind of developed so that you can, you know, so that people like John Ford can go out and shoot the Battle of Midway. Um, but they begin to work their way back into professional production. This is one of the first kinks in the studio system, the ability of people with less money and less resources to make movies, as well as the major studios with all the equipment and all the resources they have, as Orson Welles called the studios, the greatest train set that a boy ever had. Um, what, this ha what happens in, in Italy, which may be one of the more important countries, you know, uh, in Europe in terms of immediate post-war, is something that has since been labeled neorealism. So you've got a, a group of filmmakers. Uh, one of the first out of the gate is Roberto Rossellini, who is um, Isabella Rossellini's, for those of you that know Isabella Rossellini's work, Isabella Rossellini's father. Um, her mother is Ingrid Bergman uh, from Casablanca. Um, directs a film called Rome Open City, which is about 
the, you know, you know, what happens in Italy during World War II is the Italian army and the Italian society begins to fall apart and Germany goes in and occupies Italy, which was of course one of their allies, but they occupy it anyway. Um, so, and then they are wiped out of Italy as America kind of drive, and the allies drive north up the boot of Italy um, and kind of destroy Italy, you know, unintentionally, but you know, it's a war, kind of destroy Italy as they go. So this takes place in Rome. It's, it's about the occupation, the last, you know, the last months of the war and the occupation of Italy by the Germans. Part of the movie was actually shot surreptitiously during the occupation before the war is even over. And then the rest of the story is put together later. The, the, the filmmakers had almost no resources. They had no lights, they had no studios, they had no dollies. They, you know, they had very little. All they could really do is shoot this movie like someone might shoot a documentary. They had to shoot it on locations. They had to shoot it out in the streets. They had to shoot with natural lighting. They didn't, there weren't stars anymore in Italy. Um, so a lot of the characters, even the main characters, are non-actors who are kind of playing a version of themselves. A few of them are, are professional actors, but a lot of the people in this movie are just, are just, for lack of a better word, real people. And if you want to see some, some material on, on, on neorealism, the most famous neorealist film, maybe the best neorealist film, is a movie from 1949 called The Bicycle Thieves, which I cannot recommend highly enough. It's on Canopy. It is a fantastic movie. You would all love it. You should, you should watch it if you have a chance. Um, it, it, again, is another movie made in this kind of documentary style. It's a little more polished, but again, shot on locations, natural lighting, very, very limited technique, very, very limited equipment. Um, all these things that Andre Bazan is saying movies ought to be um, is, is what these neorealist films are. They're also not dealing with fantasy worlds. They're dealing with the real world, with poverty, with joblessness, with you know a society falling apart after a war has 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 wrecked through the bicycle thieves is all about a guy who in in a time of incredible unemployment finally manages to get a job is going to be able to support his family and all he needs to have this job is a bicycle and someone steals his bicycle and this bicycle is becomes the most important thing in the world for this guy to be able to support and save his family. He goes on a trek with his son trying to find a bicycle. That's the drama of the story, right? It's not Casablanca. It's not that kind of heightened sort of story. It's a down to earth kind of story. This is what these filmmakers were doing. These Italian neorealist films had an enormous impact on some filmmakers in America, okay? So you can go in here, you can look at some clips of, of Rome Open City and the Bicycle Thieves. And by the way, it's also happening in other countries. In Britain, they're, they've got a thing called kitchen sink realism. They're, again, they're, instead of, you know, instead of these being sort of, you know, Shakespearean or movies about the upper class, they're, they start making movies about the lower class and the working class. Um, and these movies start to bring in a lot of sort of social commentary and, uh, uh, sex and uh, you know all of these other things that have kind of been 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 disallowed in movies for so many years they are very influential as well and I think the one thing we could argue is that these realistic movements are certainly very influential on, on the waterfront which if nothing else we should recognize as a movie that doesn't seem to have the content or the look of the studio movies we've seen before it's not stagecoach it's not citizen Kane it's not uh, singing in the rain. It's it's not Vertigo. It's not Casablanca. It's 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 a something different. Okay, that's my long-winded um, introduction. Um, so we, hopefully most of you have had a chance, and we'll take the opportunity to watch um, um, None Without Sin, which is about the relationship of Elia Kazan, the director of this movie, to Arthur Miller. Um, it's a terrific documentary. It's really kind of a lot of fun in a lot of ways. So I really recommend it. We're probably going to talk about it today because I know some of you have already seen it. Some of the other people that are worth mentioning, um, we, should we, we should mention Bud Schulberg, 
who wrote this screenplay, Elia Kazan, famously, you know, another, like Orson Welles, another director who came from the theater, but who came from a way different style and a different background of theater than Orson Welles did. Um, and who had great respect for authorship and for scripts and for playwrights. Um, so he had a real partnership with Bud Schulberg. He basically said, we will change your script as we go along, but we will never change anything unless you agree to it. Interestingly, Sam Spiegel, who produced this movie, one of the things Sam Spiegel thought was ridiculous was the love story. He wanted to cut the love story. Jack Warner, by the way, at Warner Brothers, wanted to cut um, as time goes by out of, <laughs> out of uh, Casablanca. So, you know, you got to be careful. Um, and it was Bud Schulberg and his agreement with Kazan. Uh, even Kazan was kind of thinking, well, maybe we don't need the love story. Um, and Kazan basically, uh, Bud Schulberg basically said, nope. I'm putting my foot down on this one. The love story stays. It's hard to imagine this movie um, without the love story. Um, the other person to mention is Leonard Bernstein, who wrote the music for this movie. Uh, at the time, Leonard Bernstein was kind of a rock star in the classical music mode. He was the conductor um, of the New York Philharmonic. He was um, an accomplished composer. Uh, one of his mentor was Aaron Copland, who is possibly the greatest American classical composer who ever lived. Um, uh, Bernstein is also considered that. Bernstein was very popular. I can't remember if it was before or after this, had a series uh, on television in which he kind of taught classical music, which is all on YouTube, and those things are fantastic. In, in fact, they courted Leonard Bernstein for this movie because they wanted Leonard Bernstein's name on the posters. Leonard Bernstein was that that big a deal. And this was a low budget movie. Uh, this was, you know, uh, with Brando, it had some it had some heat because Brando had some heat. But um, they were looking for some, you know, someone to do the, 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 uh, the music for this movie that would not only write a good score, but would actually bring them some some market value, marketing value. OK. Now I'm, I'm really going to stop now. I'm going to throw it out to you guys. What do you, where do you want to go on, on the waterfront? And Elia Kazan and Arthur Miller and Hollywood Blacklist and anything else. <laughs> I just see a lot of names. I see almost no faces anymore. Um, Everybody is hiding themselves now. I, I guess I'll start. I, I really enjoyed this one a lot. Um, for several reasons. I mean, it really surprised me. I think it was the big thing. I thought it was going to be a very sad ending and I, and I didn't get that and it kind of surprised me with that. Um, um, I, I liked the technique of like, it felt very French New Wavy of like just having a blaring, jarring sound come in when really important dialogue is being mm. said and you can't yes. hear it. Like when he tells her about how he was basically accessory to her brother's murder and you don't hear any of that dialogue, it's just the, the horn and their reactions. Um, the big thing I want, it was like, I've, I've watched some of, of None Without Sin, and what really surprised me was that this was somehow controversial or hard to make because they thought it was too out there. Like, I know that Kazan was a communist at one point, and that Miller, who wrote the screen, or the, the screen that the, the, the play on the hook, the hook, right? Yes. That was left-leaning. Not even a play, the hook was, an, in fact, a screenplay. They were working. Okay, that they were, okay, so they, that he was left-leaning. But when I watch this, I actually see a lot of how unions can become co-opted and become corrupt. So a lot of this movie, does, it doesn't feel very lefty propagandy to me. Like it ends with them all going on strike essentially and doing what a union should do and them uniting kind of a thing. And that's all feels great, but most of it doesn't feel very like propagandy to me. So it just it surprised me that it was just that, that it's, oh, this is too far out there, but I guess that's just a product of the times. Yeah, that, that's that's partially it. Boy, you just <laughs> I'm gonna try. You've hit on so many so many amazing points. Uh, let me let me let me try to to address them uh, one at a time here. Let me start with this idea of the, the the fact that studios didn't seem to want to make this. So um, you've got Elia Kazan and Arthur Miller going around with a much more sort of left wing script in the late '40s. Um, and I suspect that there was some tarnish on this project that was left over from them going around to all the studio heads and trying to sell them on the hook earlier on. 
Um, so, so for those of you that don't know, Arthur Miller and Elia Kazan both worked for, for quite some time on a, a, a screenplay called The Hook, which was, you know, a sort of an early version of On the Waterfront. It was, you know, it was about corruption on the waterfront. Um, this isn't a very left-leaning film. Um, and one of the reasons is that, look, a lot, of, okay, so Hollywood Blacklist, um, House on American Activities Committee, part of the United States Congress comes in, start invest, starts investigating Hollywood, starts pressuring Hollywood, starts subpoenaing people and trying to force them to not only admit that they are communists because of this fear of communists in the 1940s and 50s, um, but also to name the names of other people that they either think are or know are communists. So there's this whole sort of parallel that we see with Arthur Miller writing something like The Crucible, which is about the Salem witch trials, where in order to not be, you know, burned at the stake or hung as a witch, you admit that you're a witch and you name five or six other people so they can go get them and you legitim you legitimize you know the the whole the whole endeavor um this is a parallel to you know the house on american activities committee committee um, eventually you know some some entrepreneurs kind of get a hold of this and think well if all these people are being named in these committees maybe we can make a buck or two by collecting all of these names and coming up with names of our own and providing them to the Hollywood studios. So the Hollywood studios know who they shouldn't hire. That these people are leftists, these people are communists, these people once gave money to some organization that may or may not be leftist or communist. Um, and there was a whole sort of cottage industry in terms of providing names to studios of people that the studios would then not hire. A lot of this is nothing but but public relations on the part of the studios. Um, Elia Kazan, famously, is one of a former member of the Communist Party who quit the Communist Party in disgust over their attempt to control the art of the artists that were in the Communist Party. Uh, famously, is one of the ones who testified who. Um, uh, cooperated with the committee and who named the names of other people. Uh, because of this, Elia Kazan uh, found himself both ostracized by the studio system themselves who had encouraged him to name these names, um, but now they kind of don't trust him either. And by all of his former, you know, actor friends and director friends and artist friends, who feel like he has betrayed them. So there's a lot of theory out there looking at On the Waterfront. Bud Schulberg, who wrote the script, is also someone who testified and named names for the House on American Activities Committee. So there's a lot of theory out there that what On the Waterfront is, is Bud Schulberg and Elia Kazan thumbing their nose at the left-wing artistic community and basically creating a story that, um, that um, uh, supports th their actions in testifying in, in, as it's often referred to early in, in this movie, being a rat. Now, we don't know what's inside these guys' heads. We know that later on, Bud Schulberg said that's nonsense. We know that later on, Evia Kazan said, yeah, that's exactly what we were doing. Um, my suspicion is that it's somewhere in between that this is a story these guys were working on. Elia Kazan had been working on it for, for, for years and years and years, but Schulberg had been working on journalism and stories about the waterfront for years and years and years. And that eventually as this story was being told, and it's based on a lot of true events, it did come around to being, oh, uh, this, this is kind of a story about that supports the idea of of testifying, of informing, you know, when the cause of informing is just. I don't think they sat down and said, let's figure out a movie we can make to, uh, to justify the actions that we took. I do think it's something they kind of recognize and lean into a bit as they make the movie, but we'll, we'll never know for sure. But because of that, you know, just that little bit of background there certainly pulls the story a bit in from, the left. When Arthur Miller 
and Ilya Kazan were pitching the hook. Um, one of the things that the, the, the studio came back to, and the, in fact, the US government came back and said is, we think this is a great movie if you make the villains communists, if the union is being run by communists, right? Um, and that's something that the whole project fell apart on that. That's something Arthur Miller didn't have any interest in doing it, doing at all. So you can, you can think of this movie as not only not being left wing, but being a statement against a certain part of the left wing. I think it's in there, but I think if we try to think of this movie as nothing but that statement, we really diminish what this movie is. And there, there's some things we can look at. We can look at the idea that there are ver many, many different drafts of this movie um, in the pre-production process that don't even have the idea of testifying. That's not part of the story. It's not until longshoremen start actually testifying in real life against the corruption of the unions, um, you know, along the whole Northeastern waterfront, um, that Schulberg adds that element into this script. So it wasn't even necessarily part of the story when they first came up with the story. Now, None Without Sin leans into this idea very extensively. None Without Sin is about the idea that Elia Kazan is making on the waterfront to make a statement to his old friend, Arthur Miller, and that Arthur Miller is making, is writing The Crucible to make a statement to Elia Kazan. And I think it's a really interesting way to look at this. Um, and I think that is there, but I think that's not the only thing that's there. Okay, so that's the left wing part. Um, the ending. Let me let me let me ask you, Braden. Um, what do you think about? How do you feel uh, if we talk about the ending being Terry goes down there, Terry basically says, "I'm glad what I done." Terry gets beaten to a bloody pulp, almost to death, and then he stands up and goes, "We're going to, we're, uh, you know, follow me. We're going to work. Screw the union, right? Which is, you know, screw the gang, not screw the union, but screw the gangsters who are running." Um, how do you feel about that ending? You said, you know, you were surprised it was a happy ending. Why were you surprised? What, what about the movie makes you surprised that you have that ending? So the whole movie, there's just a sense of foreshadowing. And it's always like, he's a bum, you know, he's a bum. And he's always, he's always, ne he's never doing the right thing. And I, I, it makes sense in retrospect that, that that's him overcoming that in the end. But, you know, even like little things like when his brother gets killed, and they're calling his name out to, they're luring him out to the street. And it's like a woman's in the street and she's like, that's exactly what they did to my Andy. They called his name just like that. So it's just like, there's, I just feel like there's constant foreshadowing that like it's not going to end well. And that there's never really, there's never anything to quote the, the female character except for like the twinkle in his eye, this kind of smirk he has that really, that is very endearing, <laughs> but, but that really like, would lead me to believe that he's necessarily going to overcome and get out from under the boot of these mobsters. I mean, he even, you know, when you find out that he threw away his entire fighting career for his brother, because his brother wanted him to throw a fight. It's like, man, this guy won't even stand up for himself, you know? So if he doesn't even stand up for himself, how is he going to, you know, stand up against these mobsters and do the right thing and grow a conscience? And, and I really like the ending. And I do feel like it has, it tilts a little bit left in the sense that, they basically go on strike. That's what they do. They, they basically act like a real union and they go on strike and we're like, no, we're not working. You know, we're gonna be in solidarity with our comrade over here who's, you know. So I, I really like that. And I do feel like the ending itself kind of tilts left in that aspect, but the whole movie essentially kind of shows how a union can be extremely corrupt and just become a scam. So there is that whole aspect that can't really just be written off. Right. So, and, you know, and maybe, maybe to some extent, and let me get back to, again, boy, you're bringing up so many points, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm losing track. Um, maybe even trying to, to position this as being left or right is, is, is doing it a disservice. So one of the things that we should recognize is that the movie is also dealing with something that was very current and very realistic at the time and for many years after, for those of you who've seen The Irishman. Um, and that, that is the, the mob control and corruption in unions, and in particular on the waterfront. There's a crusading priest 
in real life, who, you know, who was going around, you know, trying to get people to just like the Carl Malden character, the priest in the movie, uh, you know, there, there were, there were corrupt gangsters who were running these, these longshore unions. Uh, they were being investigated by the, 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 the federal government and, and local governments. Um, you know, the, the corruption was being revealed. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a, you know, for, for lack of a better term, this is a sort of ripped from the headlines, um, kind of story. So, um, and it is sort of, you know, it is kind of telling the, the, the real story that was happening. So, you know, maybe we do it a disservice by focusing too much on, is it left or is it right? Those are, those are kind of binary. Right ideas that you know sometimes art works much better somewhere in the gray area than in the black and the white um david thompson who is a film historian and a film critic and is interviewed extensively in none without sin uh says something i think is very interesting to consider um, about the ending and what he says is you're, you're watching this movie you're going through this story the right ending the correct ending to the story is that Terry dies. Everything is leading you to the conclusion, to the idea that Terry's a martyr. Terry is a Christ figure to right. some they, extent. They even, the, the priest even says like, he says like every time this happens, it's a crucifixion. Like every yes. time somebody goes to snitch and they get killed, this is a crucifixion. So it's just like, okay, so he's gonna be crucified and be a martyr too. You know, and, the, and, and David Thompson thinks it's a bit of a cheat. You know, it gives you a happy ending where maybe this story doesn't deserve a happy ending. Uh, maybe a happy ending isn't the right for this, for this story. Um, now, this was something that was considered in the writing process. It was something that Elia Kazan absolutely insisted on and would not back off of. And that is that Terry lives and that Terry um, overcomes, and that Terry is triumphant. This is something else that a lot of critics look at the movie and go, okay, so the guy who is the snitch, who does inform, and who names names, is, is not only doing the right thing, but he is going to triumph in the end. Now I, I have a slightly more 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 interest. Well, maybe not interesting. I shouldn't make my say my own ideas are interesting. I, I have something that interests me in terms of a thought process, which if you if if you do go with the the sort of martyr Christ figure of this, that to some extent what we see when Johnny Friendly uh, beats Terry to a pulp is we do kind of see Terry die, and that we have sort of a resurrection at the end, which really let you lean into the uh, the Christian symbolism if you want. Um, it is certainly something also that's just interesting from a dramatic perspective. You know, the idea that you tell a story in a certain way, Aristotle said this, you tell a story in a certain way and you tell it the right way, the ending is inevitable, right? Or at least there's an ending that feels inevitable. Um, I think most of us see the story and we don't want Terry to die. So I think we're perfectly fine to accept this as, as we go along. And I think having Terry stand up and walk in and lead everyone else in and become this, this, this leader, um, you know, is a very satisfying sort of ending. The, the, the question becomes for any one of us who wants to consider it, does it, does it feel like it fits? No. I think it does. And bouncing off the point that you made about like the, when Terry gets beat up, that's kind of like him dying and him kind of resurrecting kind of a thing. I, I saw that as like, oh, when they're telling him to get up, it's like this time versus what he did in the past when he threw the fight and he just stayed down, this time he's gonna get up. So this time's different. So I felt like that's why it felt very deserved because it's like, no, he's really changed. This time he's not gonna lay down and take it. This time he's gonna get up and fight back. No, that's good, that's really good. Let me, let me I'm gonna share the screen just for a second here uh, when you guys get into the powerpoint um the other thing that that uh brayden mentioned um uh, for th this technical idea of of we 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 kind of we we become distanced 
from Terry's confession. And it also, to some extent, becomes heightened by the fact that we can't hear it. That instead we're hearing this shrieking industrial sound that is drowning it out, right? The content of it is not important because we already know what he's saying. We already know what he's going to say. Um, so to some extent, if we wipe out the content, the, the text, the language, and we're allowed to focus just on the performances, which is what this does, um, that can become really, really powerful. One of the things I want to, uh, you know, I'm going to be asking you guys to do is to look at a couple of videos, um, one of which is an essay on moments like this, which is called When Words Fail in Movies, that um, I'm trying to think of what other movies are, are referenced here. Uh, the Matrix, um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh, Lost in Translation, the on the waterfront scene, The Graduate, which is getting ready to come up, um, North by Northwest, which is another film of Hitchcock's and has a very, very kind of similar scene, but in a different motivation. It's that the, the information that's being conveyed here is exposition that Hitchcock finds absolutely, completely, in, unendurably boring. But he, he needs to show one character telling the other character that, so he just has it on a runway of an airport and they're drowned out. You just can't, you don't hear it, doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, to get other kind of examples of how this technique is used, and I've also added a scene, um, we won't take the time to watch it now because I also know when I play stuff here, it really sounds crappy and that's really, <laughs> the sound is the whole issue. There's a wonderful scene here from a movie called All That Jazz from, I think, 19, I want to say 77? maybe, um, directed by uh, a guy named Bob Fosse. Um, it's, it's about, um, what's about Bob Fosse? It's about a guy who is directing a musical on Broadway and they have their first read through of the script and the script is just horrible. And instead of hearing them read these terrible lines of dialogue and these awful jokes, we kind of go internal to Roy Scheider, all Roy Scheider who's playing Bob Fosse. We only hear his fingers tapping on the table, his chair squeaking, the pencil in his hand that he's squeezing and grinding, and all of the rest of it goes away and it creates this incredible sense of tension. So be sure you take a look at that um, as well. Braden, you got anything else you wanna follow up with? I mean, no, that was, I mean, that was pretty much everything. I mean, that's how the ending felt very satisfying to me because it felt like he overcame his bumness, his, this, this sort of how he was a pawn. He finally like stood up for himself and therefore the rest of the actual union. And he, he changed in that aspect where before he had, you know, through the fight and he lay, stayed laid down. Well, you know, there's something else that happens there at the ending too, that I don't think happens anywhere else in the film, which is, we have, we get inside his head. We, we have his direct point of view. We see the world through his eyes as he's stumbling and walking and it's going in and out of focus, uh, which, which, you know, we've talked about with Hitchcock. It really directly connects us with a character to see the world, you know, exactly the way the character. And that shot again made me think of like, oh, this is like when he was boxing and he, you know, you know, you get knocked down and it's like blurry and you're, you know, is he gonna get? Is he gonna get up from the count, or is he gonna stay down? It kind of felt like that, or made me think of that. Well, you know, there's there's an interesting essay. Um, am I still am I still sharing? I am. Okay, hold on a second. There's a really interesting essay um, by Roger Ebert, who basically considers On the Waterfront to be a boxing movie. Um, he says, think about it, On the Waterfront doesn't quite fit in as a gangster picture the same way that Raging Bull doesn't feel like a boxing film, even though there's not a single scene where sluggers dance around within the confines of a ring, Kazan's film is in fact a boxing film in disguise. He even talks about the idea of the priest being sort of the stand-in for the trainer. Um, Terry needs the priest like a boxer needs a trainer. 
So if you want to drill a little bit more into that as a sort of twist on the idea of the genre, um, you can click in and take a look at this um, Roger Ebert essay. So let me stop sharing. All right, we're back. I have this funny feeling I was sharing for like half an hour. <laughs> I just realized the way my screen looked. I think I may have. Okay, well, you know, operator error. Who else has got something about on the waterfront? Do you think there are any um, movies today that rep that um, represent the Me Too movement versus how this one represented the blacklist? Hmm. There's. Do you? Mm. I mean, it's only been around for a few years. How long was this one made after everyone came out with the blacklist? Well, this is 54, and the House and American Activities Committee starts investigating in 1947. The studios get together in 1948 and form what is referred to as the Waldorf Agreement, because they did it at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where they kind of agree that anyone they can identify as being a communist or a communist sympathizer, they will not hire. And that's the beginning of the blacklist. The blacklist goes through, I'm trying to remember what year something like Spartacus was, I'm thinking, 58. I'm looking at Steve Jarrett and trying to see if he remembers. Yeah, so somewhere around 58 is when the chinks really start to come into the um, into the system. So we've got that period of time, about 10 years, you know, about 48 to 58, in which the the black. So, so we're writing them. We're kind, we're kind of you know near the end of it, but certainly the production, the writing of this movie would have been right in the middle of it. And there, you know, there's several movies um, that purport or, or an, an analysts uh, purport them to be, you know, th perhaps thinly veiled um, um, de de depictions or criticisms of the Hollywood blacklist. One is Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1956, which I think you can kind of look at the Body Snatchers as being almost anything. They could be the communists that you're fighting against. They can be the, uh, the the right wingers who are going against com I mean they can, they, they, they kind of can stand in for anything. Another one is is a movie called High Noon, and there's lots uh, on on the internet about High Noon and the blacklist as well. In terms of the Me Too movement, and in terms of that being kind of a subtext, really, you know, not the main text. I guess stuff like Bombshell, where the Me Too movement is the text. Uh, but in terms of the Me Too movement being, I, I'm not thinking of anything off the top of of my head um there's the but, movie, yeah there's the movie that they did about the fox news anchor women there's that's that bombshell movie. yeah and that's what i'm saying that's that's it's kind of way out i mean it's obviously about yeah. that um something that's 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 addressing it sort of you know more as subtext i i have, I'll have to think about it I, okay not, yeah good question though evan that was uh, evan hunter by the way gr uh, uh graduate joining us what else about on the waterfront, guys? I see people looking thoughtful. I think Max, <laughs> Max is talking, but we can't hear him. Max Fisk is talking. Yeah, you're not muted, Max, so we should be able to hear you. He's got that look on his face like I do. And <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, figure out. Say again? Was... Yeah, we got you. Okay, yeah, that's weird. My headset said connected voice, but for some reason my voice wasn't going through. So anyway, um, I can't help but wonder, like a similar thought to like the whole Vertigo thing that started us off, like if this movie came out today, because nowadays there's a lot more... Um, themes about questioning authority like that's become more of like a common topic so i can't help but wonder if this movie would have been more supported if this if on the waterfront came out today well you know the, and again we're we're in the hollywood studio system we have to to recognize that what's happening in the 50s um and what's happening post-world war ii is that there are more and more, so, and, and I'll have a document for you, a little more detail about this, 
we're, we're getting more and more into an area era in which there is are openings for quote unquote independent producers um, who at this period of time will be people who kind of find the money and finance films and then make arrangements with the larger studios to distribute them. Because at this point, um, the studios still own the theaters, although that's something else that's happening, you know, in the late forties as well, is that the Supreme Court is basically ruling, no, you can't do that anymore. And they're having to divest themselves from their theaters and their distribution arms. Um, so, you know, so something like The Searchers was not produced by a major studio. It was actually produced uh, by, I think it was Walter Wanger who, who produced The Searchers. Um, on the Waterfront is directed, is produced by Sam Spiegel, and then it is distributed, I can't remember which company distributed it, but it's distributed by a different company. Um, so they are working kind of beside and in, in, in cooperation with, but outside as well, the studio system. The studio system always kind of seemed to be, you know, as a large entity and as a generalization, seemed to be kind of pushing maintaining status quo, right? I mean, the production code kind of does that. The attitude of the guys who are running the place kind of does that. Um, so when you get something that, that kind of, you, you know, the Warner Brothers were, were very famous for kind of being the other edge of that and really liking to push, you know, movies that were really dark and kind of gritty and had a, you know, had some social commentary going in them. It was harder and harder for them to do that as the production code came became more and more powerful through the 40s, the 30s and 40s. Um, now I've forgotten what point I was trying to make. So, so yeah, yeah, we look at this movie now and we think, well, this doesn't seem to be all that controversial. Um, you talk about what would this movie be like now? And the thing that I keep, keep going back to, but I haven't had a chance to think about it in great detail yet, is I keep going back to The Irishman. Right, which is Martin Scorsese's recent film for Netflix, his three hour opus, which is in fact all about union corruption. I mean, that's what it's about. The main character is a guy who basically kills people, you know, for 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 you know, for the people who are running the unions and for gangsters who are who have um um, um infiltrated uh, the unions. Um but it's a totally different kind of approach because it's really not about that corruption. It is, if it's, you know, I think what it's really about is about the sort of the character, you know, it's, it's, it's about the, 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 the damage that is done, the price that is paid by someone who decides to live, you know, a life like that, rather than having any kind of political or social commentary, I think about the situation to any great extent. Um, I'm, try, I'm trying to think, you, you know, we, we just mentioned something like, uh, uh, I don't know, do you guys have any thoughts about, you know, movies that are, are kind of performing the same kind of function in today's cinema that something like On the Waterfront seems to be performing? You know, I keep, I keep even thinking about Law and Order, the TV series, which, you know, is always talking about, you know, the stories being ripped from the headlines, which really is, is something that's going on with On the Waterfront. It's a, a story that is currently happening, um, and these filmmakers sort of take on that, that particular story. I feel like there are a bunch of movies that are about that, but for some reason, none of them are coming to mind. I know I'm, I'm having, I'm just sort of, I'm, I'm a dry well today for some reason. Yeah, I, I kind of want to say 1984, but that's more about like resisting that communist government where this is more resisting more capitalist ideals. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I'm trying to think of that specifically and that's where the challenge is. I'd imagine there'd be a lot more recent films though is like questioning the capitalists beliefs is more of, is more of like a modern thing yeah you know i keep going back to bombshell again for some reason um and you know the fact that that is you know that is a, a story that is again ripped from the headlines and it is you know making commentary about you know a situation that's currently you know in the news and and in society certainly i think the point i was going to make is that as we as we move out of a period of time as the power of the studio system wanes and there are lots of reasons for this that, that we can get into. 
we, we have um, the ability of independent producers to begin to make movies outside the studio system. It's much easier for them to do that. We have the Supreme Court making it so that the studios can't control the theaters and the distribution of theaters anymore. There was a practice called block booking. I think we've talked about that where, okay, you go to an independent theater and you go, you want Gone with the Wind and you want The Wizard of Oz this year? You got to take every other MGM movie, you know, we're going to, so basically the theater becomes an MGM theater. So that's, that's, that's being overruled by the Supreme Court. So that's a big part of the power of the studios is the fact that they not only control production, but they control distribution and exhibition. So that's going away. Television's coming in. It gets, starts getting really popular in 1948, and that's taking a lot of business away. And, the, and the, you know, and, and, you know, obviously as the business begins to falter, the studio system also begins to falter. We have the counterculture coming in, you know, kind of pushing against the idea of movie censorship. We've got a lot of movies coming in from Europe that are not censored and are, you know, have much more adult content. Um, we, we have eventually the production code collapsing and being replaced by a ratings code. Um, and and with, with the studio system kind of beginning to lose control, movies that make sort of political statements or social statements that the studios might not have agreed upon uh, or might not have wanted to promulgate um, become easier to make, you know? So and we, we can't say there weren't social commentary movies. I mean, the Warner Brothers were all over social comedy uh, commentary, particularly in the period from like 29 to 34 before the production code came in and kind of quashed um, a lot of that social commentary. It's a period called the pre, pre-code period, pre-code films. Um, but certainly it becomes easier to make this kind of commentary as we go along through the 50s, into the 60s, even into the 70s, than it was when the industry was under such control by such a small number, of, you know, the whole industry, not just production, but distribution, exhibition, everything under control, just a small handful of, of men. Right. Um, so, it, it, you know, we're, we're getting ready to see in a couple of weeks uh, or talk about probably next week, uh, do the right thing. You couldn't make do the right thing. <laughs> under, there's like a thousand reasons you couldn't make do the right thing under the studio system. Um, not the least of which is all the people are black. Um, that does bring up something that's interesting, though, that, that I think is worth mentioning. Um, and I'm getting slightly off of your topic now, Max, if you don't mind. That's fine. Um, and that is that, did you notice that there is one African-American longshoreman in the movie? Yeah, I did. And he didn't really seem to have that many lines or play a, an important role at all. But... And he doesn't. Um, but at this period of time, those unions were segregated there would not have been a black longshoreman in that union. So the, the fact that, that they have put him there, even with, even just as, you know, a visual element um, is a statement in and of itself. Sadly, it's, you know, it's not much of a statement, but it's a statement. Yeah. What else guys on the waterfront? Is there anybody else on besides these three gentlemen who talked? I see Steve. Is everybody else on? Everybody else is, is watching TV and in another room. I, I have something, hey, it's on. not really on the waterfront, but I, okay. I thought of a movie, a movie that um, goes with kind of the same topic is uh, Parasite. Kind of goes into uh, uh, the differences in social class, at least in Korea. That's the only thing that I could kind of think of that's like, more related to bombshell that's not bombshell but i don't know no that makes sense it's it, and it's certainly it's it's more subtext within a drama rather than it just being about the thing itself which which i, I think is interesting and by the way if you haven't seen it and you have hulu it just popped up on hulu um last year's you know best picture oscar winner so uh well well worth seeing in, in terms of movies that are like social commentary, I feel like these days a lot of them are just very unfun. Like uh, Citizen Four, you know, like the Edward Snowden movie. Yeah. Like they're very heady intellectually, yeah. Yeah. kind of. Uh, the one that I like that comes to mind is not subtext, but it's uh, Sorry to Bother You. 
I feel like the, oh, I love that movie. Yeah, I feel like the issues that we're dealing to today are so ridiculous and so over the top, and it feels so obvious that it's that like you have, to, you have to slide into satire in order. Right, exactly. To them. Yeah, it has to, like beat him over the head with satire, basically. <laughs> you know, these kind of emotional dramas where we do the issues that we don't see something like on the waterfront, where like the social commentary is kind of woven into the background. It's like the social commentary becomes the story of the drama and then it becomes too, in, gets in the weeds of it very much. It's, we lose the drama, I think. Well, you know, I think, I think the great success of On the Waterfront, and one of the things we should mention is that On the Waterfront um, was a huge hit. I mean, a giant hit and it won, I think, eight Academy Awards. I mean, this is an enormous success. Uh, which, 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 you know, uh, None Without Sin would suggest that that made it even, even harder for poor Arthur Miller, who's the Crucible was not doing too well on Broadway. Mm -hmm. um, part of the six, and, and by the way, you know, this being a movie that was a success in its time, unlike Vertigo, which was not a success in its time, unlike The Searchers, which was not a success in its time, unlike Citizen Kane, that was not a success in its time. Um, I think that what makes this movie work is that it is first and foremost a really well told story. It is not burdened by the message it is trying to present, right? I mean, it really is. It is the characters, it is the situation, the crises the characters are thrust into, it is the interplay between them, it is the performances that are delivered, it is the, the really sharp writing and the structure of the story uh, that kind of propels us forward. I, I think all of that is what, is what makes it a memorable movie. Th there are lots of movies that have messages, but if they're not well-told well stories or well-made stories, they, they, don't, they don't last. You know, I think it was uh, Harry Cohn, who was in charge of Columbia Pictures Studio, who once said, uh, was famously quoted as, I hope this makes sense. By the way, I hope this quote makes sense now. It may not make sense to anybody anymore. He was famously quoted, you know, talking about movies that have messages. He was famously quoted as saying, if you want to send a message, call Western Union. Um, Western Union was a company. <laughs> Western Union was a company uh, before there was internet and even before you know, that used to send telegrams to people. So that's what he means by if you want to send a message, call Western Union. I, 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 I eagerly await the day when I've got to explain what the Ku Klux Klan was to students because they don't know what it was, but I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. Um, I don't think I'm gonna live to see the day. Uh, we got about five minutes left, guys. What else about on the waterfront at this point? Or, or about None Without Sin, for that matter, that whole um, story. All right, I'm going to sh let me share real quick and just kind of scan through this and see if there's anything here that I uh, want to mention. Um, at least just going by it quickly. Um, well, we sh you know we, we we should just say say a little bit um, about the acting uh, and the casting. Um, in fact, let me stop sharing. Sorry. Um, I don't know, are you guys noticing that the performances in this film feel different than something, let, let's, let's just, let's say, let's pick Casablanca, let's say, than something like Casablanca, do, do, and, and can you identify what those differences seem to be? It seems to me like um, they're less of a stage play it seems like less of a stage play than the other ones are. Yeah, the acting seems a little more. Oh, good, these headphones are working now. It looks like a, like the act, like the acting is a little more realistic compared to like the real world. Right. Um, so, part of that is of course writing, right? So the Hollywood studio, you know, something like Casablanca is known for its snappy dialogue and all of its quotes, right? And all of its cleverness, 
right? Which is also part of that. It's not really realistic. It's something that's kind of heightened. You know, we all wish that our brains worked in such a way that we would have all the retorts that that the Claude Rains character comes up with in a moment, right? In those movies, and you know, we even have you know you know a sort of standard for Hollywood films, particularly of the '30s, of this rapid-paced dialogue and this sort of mid-Atlantic accent that really isn't an accent anywhere, but it's kind of been created. Um, and then, and we have, you know, this acting style that is, is sometimes is referred to as indicating, although indicating is a bit derisive. Um, it's, it's often referred to as classical acting, right? And the idea of this acting is it's a conscious thing that you do. You, you make specific decisions about what your posture is going to do, how you're going to, to say a line, where your pause is going to be, um, um, what, what your pace is going to be, you know, is, are you going to smile? Are you going to frown? It's, it's something that you take from the outside and you put on. Whereas the acting that, as it is being presented by people like Elia Kazan, by the group theater, by the actor studio, by Stanislavski, by, um, uh, and all the other people who sort of taught at the actor studio, is to bring these things from, broadly speaking, look, there are all these different teachers who teach, quote unquote, the method or a method, and they, they all have different approaches, and they all fight with each other, and they all disagree with each other. But what it boils down to is you're doing something to bring the emotion actually out of you. Rather than planning that you're going to do something, you're going to feel it, and it's going to come out. There are some, there are some, um, teachers who really emphasize the idea of sense memory or emotional memory, the idea that if there's a feeling I'm supposed to present in this moment, I have to be feeling it. And if it's, you know, if, if I have to be sad, I need to remember when my dog got run over by a car. You know, that's a ridiculous example, right? But I need to do something inside that will make that feeling happen in, to some extent in reality, not completely, but in reality. Um, there are others that focus on objects, right? The idea of that, that objects have certain, you know, you, you focus all of your attention on an object, that object has emotional resonance for you and, and the emotions can come out of that object. There are other teachers who focus more on the idea of imagination, right? But instead of, instead of calculating what you're gonna do with your face and your posture and your words, um, you use your imagination again to put yourself into the moment into the emotion so that that emotion then comes out from the inside, right? So what we see in, in Marlon Brando, for example, is, is maybe the greatest example of this, is we see the thought process, right? We see him make mistakes. We see him have to back up. We see him not sure what he's gonna say. We see the thought form in his head before it comes out of his mouth, right? And that is a result, you know, that's the simplest idea, the simplest result. Uh, here, here's a story. Um, so in, in the scene where Terry and Edie are walking through the park, during rehearsals, um, Eva Marie Saint, who plays um, Edie, dropped her glove by accident, right? Now, if you're a film actor from the classical period of time, you just go, well, that's going to be a cut. We're going to start over because that's a mistake, right? If you're a theater actor from the method, one of the first things you're going to be taught is if something happens on the stage, you incorporate it, right? Because it happened. You can't get away with it. There's not a second take, right? So when this happened in rehearsal, Brando picks it up. He starts playing with it as he's talking and delivering his lines. She tries to get it back from him. She, she is totally in it as well. They are in this moment. It is not something where they're in a script and they're on a path. They're in the moment that is here. And that moment is going to lead to another and lead to another and lead to another. And maybe the script is going this way, but these moments may push you this way. So they go through this whole thing with the glove and the glove becomes a really important part of the scene in rehearsal. And they say, well, let's just do that. Let's do it again when we do the take. So it's not really improvisation per se, but it's something that arises from the improvisation that is part of rehearsing. 
that they find this moment, they find this, this object, which they can kind of focus on um, from something that happened in the, in the real world rather than in a fake world. And it kind of ties that whole scene, I think, together from an emotional standpoint, from a performance standpoint, in a way it might not have had. Now, in the minute I've got left, the opposite side of that is what happened to poor Rod Steiger, who plays Terry's brother, in the very famous scene in the back of the cab, which is one of the most famous scenes, certainly acting scenes in the history of cinema. Um, you may know from None Without Sin that Brando didn't want to work with Elia Kazan because Elia Kazan had named names. And Brando had turned down this role several times. And he was convinced to do it, but he made certain demands. And one of his demands was that it would be so stressful to be working with Elia Kazan that he had to be able to leave the set every day at 4.30 and go see his therapist. This is the beginning of Brando basically becoming a, 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 a sort of a, a satire of himself rather than you know uh, someone who cares about acting. Um, so they shot the two shot of of uh, of um, Marlon Brando and um, um, I just said his name. Oh my God! Hold on. How can I? How can I forget this? Um, his brother, oh my God. Um, they shot the two shot. I keep wanting to say Eli Pollock. Who is it, guys? Charlie <laughs> Rod Steiger. Rod Steiger, oh my God. Okay, I've been in the house too long. Um, <laughs> they shot the two shot. They shot Brando's close up. And, and, you know, and Rod Steiger does what any good actor will do. He stayed there and played his part off camera. So Brando has the ability to really act and really, you know, sort of, it's not fake. He's really in the moment with this other person, this other human being, right? Even though that human being is not on camera. When they went to turn around to do his close up, it was time for Brando to leave for his therapy session, so he left. And this, this scene um, has him performing to the script supervisor who's reading Brando's lines out of a script, which I think makes the scene even all the more kind of amazing. But it is something that he held as a grudge for his entire life. And if you want to see, um, there's a, there is a, um, uh, there is a little, in the PowerPoint, there's a little interview with him where he talks about how disappointed he was in that. And if you want to see how disappointed, um, um, Christopher Reeve was in working with him. You can look that up too. There's a great interview with Christopher Reeve saying, you know, Brando just was, you know, in Superman, he just didn't care. He just didn't care. Mm -hmm. um, give me just one second to kind of just scan. I know we're past time. Uh, do, do take a look. I, you, this was in the textbook, so you may have already seen it, but there's an interest, really, really interesting essay, vi vi video essay on the various aspect ratios that this movie was, I think three different aspect ratios this movie was prepared to be uh, shown in. And the way in which that really can sometimes really change, um, you know, how you react and how you relate to a particular scene. Um, the other thing that, that I, I and, and again, there's also some, uh, some video essays in here. It, it'll tell you what you're supposed to watch and what you're not. Uh, one of the things I would like to uh, recommend before we end up here today is, to take another look at this particular scene um, when um, Edie and Terry are being chased down the alley. Um, On the Waterfront is not a neorealist film. It's influenced perhaps by neorealism, particularly in the fact that it's all shot on location in the real places where these things were really happening, that the background actors are really longshoremen, you know, that it is a story that is really happening. It's about sort of lower class and working class individuals, but it is not a neorealist film in that they still do use a lot of cinematic technique. And the scene where they're chased in the alley, there's some very, very interesting stylistic sort of film noir. If you don't know what film noir is, look that up. Film noir kind of lighting. And there is in particular a terrific moment um, 
of, of, of what we call in the business a reveal, right? So we know that, that we can just cut to something and we show it to the audience. But sometimes it's, it, you bring the audience to something if you reveal it in some way rather than just popping it on the screen. So after the truck goes by and they have avoided being run over by the truck, <laughs> You have the truck wipe the screen and reveal Rod Steiger's body hanging there. And it is also acting as a point of view for Terry. Um, and I would argue that's a really, you know, with the light that's back there behind it, that's a really dramatic piece of cinema, you know, uh, it, it, to, to kind of reveal what has happened to his brother. You guys got anything, any last things before we sign off? Uh, yeah, I have a quick yeah. question about yeah. the class. Yes, please go ahead. I'm sorry, I meant to ask that to begin with. So, first of all, okay, okay, so, um, that project where it was like the, it was like the video essay or like the 10 different looks of about movies, is the or, due date on that? Or a paper, you know, or just. Or a paper, yeah, was, was the due date on that set in stone? Because I think you said something last session where it was like. No, I mean, you know, I'm trying to give you, look, look, the earlier you can get it to me, the better it will be because there are going to be 70 of these things coming in. Um, and it takes me a while <laughs> to read them and watch them and grade them. I also kind of like to read them and watch them and grade them before we get together for that last session during the exam period, because sometimes I like to ask you guys about them or even show some of them or talk about the things that you guys have been studying, you know, kind of on your own outside of class. Um, so certainly I, I desperately need everything by then, if, you know, if, if not before. Um, but yeah, I, I want to give you guys as much slack as possible. So I, I'd rather you get it done well and do it the way you want to do it. Just keep in mind, I got to get these things graded and get a grade to you. So certainly the sooner, the better it is for me, certainly no later than the exam period. Is that fair? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And um, cause I'm doing a video essay. So, would there be a specific place for me to submit it, uh, like say the Dropbox? You know, or... a lot of people are having trouble with the Dropbox because, uh, be, you know, the with the the Dropbox.com Dropbox, because if yeah. you've got your own Dropbox account and your Dropbox is full, it won't let you then put something in this other Dropbox, which is incredibly stupid. So I'm I'm kind of recommending to people, you know, it, you you can just upload it to YouTube or Vimeo and send me a link. And if they if if they don't kick it down for some copyright reason, you can also you can you can try that Dropbox. You can try the sort of Microsoft Share, the Google, you know, the Google Drive Share. What, however, you are comfortable sharing a large file, I'll get it. Okay. Anything else, guys? All right, I will see you guys next week. And goodbye to all of you that aren't listening. Goodbye. <laughs> see, why don't you <laughs> what was that, Ethan? Goodbye. Never mind. Okay. Evan, I didn't realize, Evan, I didn't realize you were in Disney World. <laughs> uh, Disneyland, get it right. And I didn't realize Max was in a swirling vortex of doom and I despair. Am in the, <laughs> the downward spiral. I'm in my happy Max, place. Did you, Max, did you have a question? I'm sorry, I thought I heard your voice. No, no, I was just saying that I'm in the downward spiral. Okay, all right. Yeah, I know the feeling. Trust me. <laughs> all, right. all right, we'll see you next week. All right, you have a good one. You too. Wait, next week? I'm sorry, uh, Thursday. Isn't... Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, yeah. I, don't, I have no idea what day it is, by the way. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. <laughs> ah, time is an illusion. It's a social construct <laughs> yeah, and all that. More so than yeah, that. But... More so than <laughs> that. More so.